It's a pleasure to have Brother Weiss appreciate him tremendously. Um, 48 years in the ministry last night. Am I right in saying that? And that's what she said. And uh, praise the Lord. I appreciate him. Thankful for him. He's got a heart for people and just has a heart for the Lord. Brother, come and preach to us. Let me make sure I get this on first. Am I on? All right. It sounds like it anyway. Please take your Bible and open to the book of Psalms. We're going to look at Psalm 85 just for a little bit. Appreciate uh, Brother uh, Dahl inviting us all to come and be a part of this meeting. It's always a privilege, isn't it, to get together with God's people and fellowship together around the Word and these great songs that we get to sing from our hymnals. And God's been so good to put us in the time period in which we are. I was telling somebody earlier today, I recently watched a film with my wife that was set back in the 50s, I think it was, and boy, life looked so much simpler and so much easier back then. And I remember, of course, growing up, uh, I was born in 1954, so I remember uh, some of that, you know, and growing up in a much different time period than today. And uh, we were watching that film, and I, I looked over at my wife and I said, wouldn't it be great to just go back in time a little ways and live in that gentler, sweet, sweeter time that easier time it seemed like, I'd gladly give up my cell phone and some of these modern conveniences that we have. And Anyway, we were visiting and talking a little bit, and then we both came to this conclusion, and that is that God has us right where we are for such a time as this. God wants you where you are for such a time as this, and he wants me where I am. Uh, I live in Dane County. Dane County in Wisconsin is pretty liberal. All right, put it mildly, all right? Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, and my brother Mike's here. He might have seen this already, but I think they're getting ready to lock us down again, brother, or at least to try. Uh, there's more and more signs in buildings and like at the mall and things like that where you've got to wear a mask and stay six feet apart and stuff like that, and I'm just uh, sick and tired of that, to be honest with you, and uh, we're going we're gonna to do our best, you know, to keep living for the Lord and serving Him, but... Uh, there's people that I know that are, uh, and many have, moving out of Dane County because of all that liberal thought and all that uh, goofiness that goes on. But uh, I, I've told people this, uh, and I'm going to keep telling people this, God wants you here. Amen. God wants us to stay where we are. Amen. If everybody runs away, who's going to be there as a witness? Amen. Who's going to be there to tell them about the Lord? Who's going to be there to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only answer for the whole world and the world's problems? So somebody's got to stay. Somebody's got to keep on going. And I just want to encourage all of you, wherever you are, don't get discouraged. And, and make sure you just keep on keeping on for the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want to finish well. I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And the best way to do that, of course, is to do well. Just stay there and just keep on doing what God's asking you to do. So now we'll get to the sermon, okay? Psalm 85. By the way, I want to say this too. Don't you like this sign right here? That banner? You know, revival starts with us and then it spills over into the world. And I want to talk to you just for a little while today about the promise of revival. Look at Psalm 85 with me if you would. Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Selah. By the way, could you say amen right there? Amen. Aren't you glad God's forgiven your sin? Amen. Praise God. Verse 3. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God of our salvation. Amen. You know, that's revival, isn't it? Turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. That's key, by the way, your decision to hear. For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, 
and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. I want to concentrate primarily on verse number six and seven. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time that we can be together. We have enjoyed the preaching so far, both last night and today, this morning already. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us as we continue with this meeting. Speak to our hearts. Speak to us, Lord. All of us who are doing any speaking today, we're just a vessel, that's all. We're just a, a tool that hopefully you can use to encourage and challenge your people today. So may we be open to that. May we all be listening. May our hearts be open and receptive. And Lord, please speak to us and help us to obey, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, the reason that we need revival, of course, is that we're not where we're supposed to be. We're not what we're supposed to be either. Many of God's churches in America today, really what they need is an old-fashioned revival. More than they need some updated program or some updated method, they need God to come and show himself strong in their congregation. You know, it's true of many churches. It's true of many people also. It's true of many pastors. We need God to come and make himself real to us. We need a genuine Holy Ghost revival that causes all of us to fall deeply in love with him. Amen. Not programs, no. but him. Amen. He's the answer for the problems that we face in America today. Many of God's people today, sometimes even God's pastors, have fallen out of love with God. And they're more in love with the world or methodology. It really is all about him. I'm going to say that a lot today in the sermon, but it's all about him. It's not about us. It's not about us and our, our, our thinking and so forth. It's all about the Lord. And what we need is we need to fall more in love with him. So I'm going to speak to you today just three very simple points. Number one is relating and revival. Number two is recognizing and revival. And number three is realizing and revival. So I hope you'll enjoy this today. It spoke to my heart. Number one, relating and revival. And I want to mention, first of all, when I think about relating and revival, we must relate revival to the past. And what I mean when I say that is, remember how it once was. Remember how it used to be. Remember how excited you were about the ministry and about the Lord of the ministry and the work that he's called you to do. You've got to relate it to the past, yeah. all right? Remember this verse, this Bible verse, Revelation 2, 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remo will remove the candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Remember this. Remember from whence thou art fallen. Yeah. How was it before? You remember when you first got saved? You remember when God first put his hand upon your shoulder and said, I want you to preach the gospel? Do you remember how it was that first few times you got to speak and preach God's word? Or let's, let's bring it up a little bit more uh, closely to more present times. Do you remember the first few Sundays in the church that you're at right now? I think about that because where I am, I've been there now 15 years this year. And you know, after 15 years, you've preached a lot of your sermons, Right? You've seen a lot of those same faces over and over again. There's still faces that, you know, are there. There's some faces that aren't there anymore, okay? But it can get routine and it can get old and it could, you could just go through the motions. You know, when that happens, we need revival. Amen. We need revival. We need that same vim and vigor and excitement that we had when we first got there. Amen. And when God first saved us and when God first called us, we need to remember so we're relating back to the past. Revival is getting back to where you used to be. Revival is getting back to where God wants you to be. See, God doesn't want you to be stale and just going through the motions. God wants you to be excited about the work of God, enthused about the work of God. So we must relate revival to the past. We must also relate revival to God's word. The longer that I've been doing this, the more I've come to appreciate God's word. Have you noticed this? People fail you? Have you noticed sometimes that even your peers fail you? 
Have you noticed that you fail you? <laughs> but have you noticed that God never fails you? And his word never fails you. It always reads the same. 50 years ago this year, I got saved. 50 years ago. I was one of those that got saved in the 70s. 1973. God's never failed me through all those years. He's been true to his word. And by the way, his word says the same thing today that it said back then. By the way, it'll say the same thing in another 50 years. Because God's word never changes. He promises in his word many, many things. One of the things is he promises to give us revival if we truly want it. If we truly desire it. We all know the verse, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Oops. We don't like that part, do we? Turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's God's promise. Amen. That's God's word. And you can take that to the bank. It's, it's true. It'll never change. Relate revival, first of all, to the past. That is where you used to be. All the enthusiasm and excitement and all that. Relate it to God's word. But then also relate revival to what God has done in the past. Do you believe that God can still do what he said he would do? Do you believe that God can still do what he did in the past? See, I do. All the time people in our church are asking this on Wednesday night during our prayer meeting when we take requests, they'll always say, you know, pray for revival, pray for revival. And we talk about this and I say, do you think that God can still send revival? Do you think that God can still revive America? Do you think that God can still revive our church and our people? By the way, I think he can. But the key here is do we want it do we want it i don't know if you sense this or not but i sense that we talk more about it than we actually do about it because to really seek god and seek revival there's a cost there's a price to pay there's something you have to do you got to get involved and you got to cleanse your heart and you got to just like the bible says here in this verse you got to humble yourself. you got to pray. you got to seek his face. you got to turn from your wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. But see, a lot of God's people aren't willing to do that. And that's why we don't have revival. My opinion, but that's why we don't have it. Relate revival to what God has done in the past. We see it in the Bible. Many times God sent revival to his people. Since the Bible's been completed, of course, God sent revival in different places to different people. He did it before. He wants to do it again. Do you want it to happen again? I hope you do. I know I'd love to see it. Number one point then is this, relating and revival. Relate it to the past, relate it to God's word, relate it to what God has done in the past. Number two, I want to talk to you about this, recognizing and revival. Recognizing and revival. Recognize a fresh and a new the Lord's person. Because again, I'm going to say it several times. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God. It's about God. There's a number of verses in the book of Isaiah I'd like to show you real quick that help us with this. Look at Isaiah 41 and verse 4. Isaiah 41 verse 4. As many years ago, I was reading through the book of Isaiah and I noticed certain verses, and I'm going to show you all of them, certain verses that remind us that it's all about God. Look at Isaiah 41 and verse 4. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. Look at chapter 42 and verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Look at chapter 43, verse 7. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Look at same chapter, verse 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen 
that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? And then chapter 44, verse 6. Just see, I turned too many pages. Chapter 44, verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who as I shall call and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, that them, I'm sorry, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Look at chapter 45 and verse 5. Several scriptures here. I hope you don't mind this. But I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation. And let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou or thy work? He hath no hands. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall let go my captives. Not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. We're almost done. Chapter 45, verse 18. Chapter 45, verse 18 says this. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, Seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, there's none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there's none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say in the Lord, have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come. And all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. Just got one more. Chapter 46, verse 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there's none else. I am God and there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. You know, this is, you know this because you've read your Bible, I'm trusting. But there's many, many verses like this in Scripture, and Isaiah seemed to have a bunch of them that many years ago, reading through there, stuck out to me. These verses remind us, don't they, that it's all about Him. It's all about Him. It's not about me. Now, that does a lot of things for me. That helps me when I get to stand up behind a pulpit and preach to people. I don't have to be afraid of their faces. Huh? 
God said that to Ezekiel, didn't he? Don't be afraid of their faces. Now, they're not going to listen. Huh? But don't be afraid of their faces. It's encouraging to me. I can stand up there with all assurance that God is helping me, God is with me, and I'm proclaiming God's word so I know it has power. And I know it's not going to return void. I know it's going to accomplish what he sends it out to do. I don't have to worry about that. Many years ago, of course, it's, it's been a long time. I've been doing this now too, but I remember the first time or two that I got to speak before a bunch of preachers and I was a little bit timid, you know, a little bit afraid and not sure exactly what to say and how to say it and all that kind of stuff. And someone reminded me, they're just sinners just like you are. They're just sinners saved by grace just like you are. They're just Christians like you are. Just try to give them something encouraging from God's word. You know, we don't have to be afraid of each other. We don't have to be afraid of the people in our congregation. We don't even have to be afraid of the people in our city where we live. We serve Almighty God. And it's all about Him. And I'm here to represent Him. And so are you. And see, revival reminds us that it's all about Him. Recognize afresh and anew the Lord's person. Recognize afresh and anew the Lord's power. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Not that I know of. There's nothing too hard for him. He tells us that in his word. Matthew 28, 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Yeah. Jeremiah 32, 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there's nothing too hard for thee. Jeremiah 32, verse 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Amen. You see, we need to recognize afresh and anew not only God's person, but God's power. Amen. God's power. You know what's going to turn our churches around and people around and hopefully one day our country around? God's power. Amen. It's not you, it's not me, it's not some new method or some new thing that we tried that we got off some internet site somewhere. It's God. It's God. And if God doesn't do it, it won't last anyway. We've got to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to lift him up. Recognize afresh and anew the Lord's person, the Lord's power, and then also recognize afresh and anew the Lord's purpose. His purpose for the saved, of course, is that they grow, that they mature, that they fall in love with him, that they do all that he wants them to do. Isaiah 43, 7, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Isaiah 43, verse 21, this people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. Listen, if you're here today and you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, you are here for Him. Amen. Don't ever forget that. You are here for Him. If you ever get too big for your britches, you're too big for your britches. Amen. Amen. You're here for Him. You and I should really just be part of the landscape. It's not about us. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to magnify Him. And who he is. He has a purpose for us, and that is to glorify him. His purpose, of course, for the unsaved is that they come to know him. So many today don't know the Lord as their Savior. John 4, 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look unto the fields, for they are white already unto harvest. Luke 19, 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You don't have to look very far to find somebody who's lost. They're all around us. And God's purpose for them is that they come to know the Lord as their Savior. But see, revival's got to start with us. And then it spills over to the world. When God's people are really in love with God, witnessing comes easy. When God's people are in love with Him, reading His Word comes easy. Prayer comes easy. Church attendance comes easy. Giving comes easy. Witnessing comes easy. That's probably a lot, a lot of the problem today, isn't it, in American churches? We really don't love the Lord like we should. Number one is relating and revival. 
Relate revival to your past, to God's word, to what God has done in the past. Number two, recognizing in revival. Recognize afresh and anew the Lord's person, the Lord's power, the Lord's purpose. And my last thought this morning is this, realizing and revival. We must not look to what we can do, but rather what God can do. Once you get to the place where you realize that it's not really up to me, that really helps a lot. My dad, uh, my two brothers are here, they know this, but my dad uh, was a Baptist pastor for a number of years. He's in heaven, went to glory a couple years back, and um, I don't know about my brothers, but I miss him nearly every day, uh, most often on Mondays, because uh, he and I would talk a lot on Mondays. And as he got closer and closer to death, of course, there was... um, more and more difficult time, you know, talking about things, but we'd, we'd, we'd talk and sometimes we'd pray and, and of course when we're in t- each other's presence, we'd talk and pray together. But I miss those times of, of just chatting with him and sharing with him things that are going on. Usually it comes around things that happen at church, you know, if you have your, your missions conference or your missions month, in our church we have a missions month and we use the Sundays and emphasize missions and so forth and take up the faith promise at the last Sunday. And as we, as we did it uh, the last time, I remember I wanted to call Dad and just talk about what had happened because we didn't think because of COVID and everything that our missions giving would go up, but it went up to the highest it's ever been. And I wanted to call him and rejoice with him about that, but I couldn't because he wasn't on the other end of the phone. And there's something that happened in the, on the other side of you know, positive or negative recently, and I wanted to talk with Dad about it, kind of a negative thing. But again, he wasn't there because he's in heaven. And one thing, this is why I bring up my dad. One thing my dad would tell us, and I'm sure Fred and and Mike, you remember this also, that it's not about us and what we can do. It's all about the Lord. You got to give it over to him. There are things that he can do that you will never be able to do. There are things that he can do in people's hearts and lives that you can never do in their hearts and lives. I remember when we went to Stoughton, uh, 15 years ago, there were some things that came up within that first year, and I'll not tell you exactly what they are, but there were 10 different things that I took to the Lord, and I remember rejoicing with my dad about this. There were 10 different things that I asked the Lord for in that first year, and every one of those 10 things God fulfilled because I prayed, because I talked with him about it, because I laid this before him and said, God, these are things I... I can't change. I'd mess it up if I did. So would you handle this for me? And every one of those 10 things he took care of. Amen. And I've seen that. Many of you have seen that same kind of thing too in your life. We need to remember, friend. We need to realize that it's not about us. Yeah. It really isn't. You know, all of us here today, we appreciate all those ideas that came up. But can we be real honest? It's not about those ideas. It's about God going to do what he wants to do in our congregation and in the lives of the people that we minister to. There's some things we can do, of course. We talked about some of this earlier. We can humble ourselves. We can pray. We can seek God's face. We can turn from our wicked ways. We can visit. We can, we can pray, of course, as I said. We can hand out tracts. We can invite. There's certain things that men are supposed to do, but the real, honest, heart work of revival is God's work. God does that. And, and we just need to get in tune with him. And we need to talk with him and plead with him that he'll send that work of revival first in our hearts and then in the hearts of our people and hopefully in the hearts of our nation. Revival comes from God. Revival is God's work. And that's why we must ask him. So realize that as you look at things, there, there are certain things you can do, but there's lots of things we can't do and God has to do it. We must believe also, when I think about realizing and revival, we must believe not only that God can, but that God will. Do you remember this verse? I think it's, uh, I hope I have the reference right, Matthew 13, verse 58. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. unbelief. You see, you've got to believe not only that God can do it, but that God will do it. It ought to be such, honestly, and I I say this often on Wednesday nights, 
with our prayer meeting, when I, when I encourage the people, now let's go pray, I say this, let's pray with expectation. Let's pray with expectation. We actually expect God to do it. Why? Because he said he would. Because he said he would. And so we've got to believe not only that he can, but that he will. We know he wants to. His word says so. But we must believe that he is not only able, but that he will accomplish exactly what he said. It's unbelief and unwillingness on our part that many times is the stumbling block. So I want to encourage you. We must not look at what we can do, rather what God can do. We must believe that God will do it. And then I want to finish this way. We must call out to God for it. We must call out to God for it. James 4, 2, you have not because ye ask not. Isaiah 43, 22, but thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, but thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. 44, verse 3 in Isaiah says, for I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. Let me ask you this, friend, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? Do you really want to see revival? How much do you want it? How much do you want it? Many years ago, a man much older in the Lord than I, he's in heaven now, but many years ago, I heard a man who was a preacher of God's word say, you're as close to God as you want to be. Boy, that's convicting. You're as close to God as you want to be. Are you thirsty? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the promise in your word that we can have revival. We can see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. We can see what they saw in years gone by, both in Bible times and also since. We can see that in our day, even if it's just in our location. But Lord, we have to want it. We have to be thirsty. We have to magnify you. We have to get rid of our sin. We've got to get rid of our lackadaisicalness. We've got to get rid of our apathy. We've got, to, we've got to fall in love with you, Lord. God, help us to be thirsty. Help us to desire this with all that we have. And then, Lord, send it. Do a great work in the churches represented here in this room this morning. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Fellas, why don't we just take a moment, no instruments, no nothing like that, but why don't we just go to the Lord? Um, we need to get God involved. We, 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 again, we, we're all real good at talking about that, but why aren't our lives revived? Folks, that thought's been on my mind, guys. That's my, that thought's been on my mind the last couple of weeks, preached actually on that topic on Sunday night. We don't want revival. We say we want it, but we don't want it because we're not willing to pay the price and pray the price to get it. Humility is not thinking lowly of yourself. I think it's just putting yourself in the position that God intended. That's all it is. He is God. There is none else. Put God in the position he belongs, and a whole lot of things will start to solve themselves. And then let's pray. Let's get God involved in this thing. And by the grace of God. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Just.